this afternoon, uh, it being December 13th, um, I just finished To Kill a Mockingbird uh, by Harper Lee. Um, there is a lot to say about this novel, I think, um, which is why it is not, it, it's one of the most read books in like early American high schools at the same time is also one of the most banned books in a number of states and I think that just it speaks to the importance of what this book says um, context wise about this book um, there is the very famous now story about Harper Lee, this being Harper Lee's one and only published novel, um, and she wanted to keep it that way for years. Um, and then she passes. She has a sister that's then in charge of the book with this lawyer kind of waiting around in the background. Sister dies. So then finally this lawyer goes out and says, it's like, oh, reverse this lifelong decision. Um, and then published the manuscript uh, Ghost of a Watchman, which I do have. I'll read that eventually. Um, but in terms of, you know, this book, right, it's... This will be very, very important about what this book has to say. Um, yeah, I, I generally do think that this is one of the one of the great American novels, um, which is then weird because unlike things like um, Moby Dick or uh, John John Steinbeck novels or you know, things like that, that are these great, long masterpieces. It's, you know, 250 pages long. And it is told through the perspective of a grown adult reflecting back on their life and reflecting back on the events that led up to the eventual ending, right? And the eventual Tom Robinson case. And I think it's just such a fascinating way to look at things. Um, I, it, when I first read this book, which was in the ninth grade, um, I internalized parts of it and never really kind of realized how I internalized them, or even where a lot of these these ideas came from, um, because that's what growing up does, is that you read and you internalize things, and you internalize lessons, and then you forget where they come from. Um, so in that regard, you know, I, I personally think that Atticus Finch is one of the greatest role models that a person can have. Um, that is not to say that he is the only role model. Um, but there's a recognition that although you want the world to change and although you want things to be different, the process in which you do them is has to be civilized. Um, which is a hard thing to grasp sometimes, right? Because uh, there are a lot of things. There are a lot of things in the world that you know you're allowed to get angry at and be frustrated at, and you want to write and you want to to, to fight. But what you're doing in that instance by fighting and by by rioting is you are playing into 
the worst case scenario of the oppressing group, right? Um, and I think it's, it's, it's hard to conceptualize this. And I think there's no, I don't think there's a lot of, of modern day active viewpoints on this, I guess, like active cases of this. Um, people are not inherently bad, it's just that they are coming from a situation in which they can, in which their their upbringing and their, their cultural efficacies are different. And if we don't learn to work with that, well then we can never fix things. Um, and that is really what Atticus Finch brings to the table. Atticus Finch is not a racist, however, he is certainly someone that struggles with race, and he recognizes that if it weren't for the fact that this case was directly given to him, he would not have taken it. And it's because he understands what this case means by him defending a black person in Alabama in the 19, this probably about ni mid to late 1930s, because there's, we start talking about Nazi Germany at one point. Talking about that, right? He recognizes that this case will do nothing but bring him harm in the end. It'll do nothing but bring him harm, it'll do nothing but bring his family harm. And it does. It, in, in the end, it absolutely does. But the entire time, not only in the case, but in the interactions with people around him, he recognizes that there are certain cultural barriers that cannot be bridged and cannot be reached through a singular person. And I think, you know, maybe I think maybe the best case example of that is Mrs. DuBose, right? Is Mrs. DuBose was a heroin addict, um, morphine addict, and um, was trying to wean off of it so that when she died, she wasn't addicted to anything and she wasn't held by anything in life, right? Which is a very powerful thing to do. It's a very, very powerful message. Um, and so he ends up having Jem read to Mr. DeBose and Scott's there. And eventually ends up in saying that, him saying that Mr. DeBose was, is the bravest person that he knows. And the reason for that is because he, she is allowing someone who's connected to, to a whole other issue that she despises. She despises the fact that Atticus will be, will be defending Tom Robinson, Robinson. She despises, you know, but she's willing to give it up in order to find what her own moral standing in the world is, if that makes sense. She is willing to give up her prejudices in order to find peace. Um, and we actually see that a lot, I think. There's just a lot of characters that go to Atticus to do the right thing and to do things that are the best. And we, we see that in the end a lot. Um, they go to Atticus to do the right thing, even if it's hard. And I think it just speaks a very powerful message about what it means to be a good person and an upright person. Um, 
because Attica certainly has its flaws. But people are willing to overlook that and over, overlook that because they know in the end he will do the right thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. Talking about the, the the Tom Robinson case, because this book, in my experience, the way it gets taught usually is through the lens of race, um, which is, I mean, entirely fair, right? And looking at the way that race is portrayed in this, right? We have a couple key points. There's a point in which we have uh, Aunt, Alex uh, Aunt Alexandria um, who moves in with the Finch family um, in preparation for the Tom Robinson trial and what's going to start happening. And she attempts to convince Atticus to remove Calpurnia from the home and ha like have her stop working there. And Atticus in that moment says, she will stay as long as she wants to. Which I think is a huge, huge thing in wording that I think it's overlooked. Because what is, what is being said in that moment is that Atticus is saying that I have no power over Calpurnia. If she wants to continue working here, she will and I will continue to pay her because she is a massive help to me and the kids. But she is under no obligation to continue working here if she does not want to. Um, which is a huge thing that I think is overlooked um, when uh, people kind of analyze this book, right? He, in that instance, Atticus is giving all of the power in the world to an African-American woman, um, which is huge, right? Um, later on, we get to, uh, we have the initial scene at the church um, in which Jem and Scout go to Calpurnia's church. Um, I won't say there's a whole lot going on there, just a oh, here's how people actually live that aren't us. Um, then this conversation between Aunt Alexandria and uh, Scout about going over to Calpurnia's house. And it's another one of those things where Aunt Alexandria is so focused on what it means to be an upright person that she can't be it herself she doesn't understand what it what it actually means um you see this through like aunt alexandria is southern hospitality right she is someone that is very very proud of of, of her lineage and who the families are, and what the connections are, and and this and this and this and this and this, and she's willing to welcome everyone to her home, and socialize with them. But she doesn't allow everyone to be her guest. People to her, people have their place in the world that you cannot escape from, because of where your lineage comes from. Which is a very much a caste system. In, in, in the first place, but then it's also this very, I want to say old, but it's not, it's not old, people still believe in this, of where you have to keep company with the same people that are similar to you, and that is how you become a, a proper and upright person, but we understand, and Jim and Scout and Atticus understand, that all you're doing then is enforcing 
the same rules have always been. And therefore, nothing ever changes. If you want to become an upright and uh, upstanding person in the world, you have to fight. And sometimes you're gonna lose. But, but you have to, to stand there and stand for what you believe in. So yeah, yeah. We then get to the actual trial. Actual trial itself, I don't think there's a lot interesting there. Um, um, we get the whole thing of seeing that, oh, Bob Ewell is actually left-handed, which would then have been consistent with the marks that were left on uh, Maela. Um, and then Tom Robinson doesn't have left hand, right? It, well, it exists. It's just that I'm caught in a meat grinder at a very young age. So it it's useless. Um, even though the case gets lost, right? Even though the case is lost, it's always been lost. There was never going to be... You know, nothing was ever gonna change that. Not in this, not in this town, not in this, not in this state, not at this time of the, not in this time, right? Nothing was ever gonna convince the world and whoever was on a jury that those, what actually transpired was that they had framed uh, Tom Robinson so that Maela didn't have to bear the social burden of kissing a black man right nothing is ever going to convince the jury to change their verdict but the one thing that Atticus says throughout the entire trial throughout the entire build up of the trial is I am going to lose this but I'm going to let the truth come out. I'm going to make the truth come out. And so in the end, everyone recognizes what has actually happened, but they cannot get over their prejudice enough to actually overturn their prejudices. Um, despite all the evidence, despite everything, and, you know, they still can't get over their prejudices. But it takes them a long time to do it, right? In a lot of cases, it, it, considering the time, considering where this is, the doors will be open and shut within minutes because it didn't matter, right? And if you want evidence of this, you can look back at... Uh, the Port Chicago 50, in which they sentence 50 men within minutes. And they didn't even care, right? So like, you know, the fact that it took so long means something. And they go on and talk about this a little bit in the, in the, in the novel, about it meaning something. They, you know, it's not a win. It's certainly, it's certainly not a win, but it's a start, right? And that's, that's another thing that's kind of hard to understand sometimes, is that two steps forward, one step back is still a step forward. It may seem like you're subtracting sometimes, but overall, you're starting to succeed. And it's a very hard concept to grasp a lot of times. Um, yeah, yeah. <sighs> Ending the novel, 
I mean, we talk about uh, the attempted murder of, of both Jim and Scouts by Bob Ewell. Um, ends up being that Arthur Radley comes out, is the one that kills Bob Ewell. Um, and then carries Jim back home. And then we get the, really the final chapter, right, is, is this culmination of everything that Scout has learned throughout what she has described about becoming more ladylike, um, becoming more empathetic towards others, right? Which seems sometimes at contrast with each other, right? She wants to be empathetic and she wants to do the right thing, but sometimes this ladylike thing isn't, doesn't, doesn't agree with what this is. And we see that a lot when um, Scout is doing the, starts attending the uh, Sunday afternoon kind of luncheons with, or visitations with Al and Alexandra. There's this, this cross that, that Scout can't quite figure out. But, you know, we get this whole thing of, there's, there's a, a quite a bit of talk about what I, I think they say the, the Mervins? I, I can't tell if they're talking about a, like a woods people or if they're talking about like a, like a Native American tribe or if they're talking about like an, an African tribe that this priest is going out and, and heading to, right? But they talk about it in the kind of afternoon sessions it's mentioned a couple times and they get to this part of where one of the ladies is saying that they're so uncivilized this group of people so uncivilized because instead of having like family units it is all of the adults responsibility to raise these children which to me, it's like, that's how you should do it. People are not just raised by their parents. Kids are not just raised by their parents. They are raised by thousands and thousands of people, right? They are raised by their parents. They're raised by older siblings. They're raised by teachers. They're raised by camp counselors. They're raised by administrators. They're raised by legislators thousands of miles away, right? Those are the people that raise them because they're the people that put the circumstances around children. But that's kind of, that's kind of besides the point. But what eventually ends up happening is, you know, we, we have this kind of argument in which Scout doesn't really seem to agree and therefore kind of just tunes it out. But then at the very end, She's standing on the stoop of the Radley House, and she's looking out at the, from the Radley House porch into the town, and she can kind of see. She says that she see, she sees something from a perspective that she's never seen before, and realizes that you can really see all of the town from here, um, and all of the street from here. And what she recognizes and realizes in that, in that in that moment is that Boo Radley, Arthur Radley, thinks of the kids just as much as his own as they are um, Attic Finches, because he has seen them grow up every single day, right? Arthur Bradley has nothing to do in his house except exist and wait and watch, right? Um, 
And so, what does he do? He sees the Finch children and Dill grow up, right? He sees it every summer, he sees it every fall, he sees it every winter. And that's why he eventually, in the end of the story, he's the one that ends up killing and protecting, well, like, protecting Jem by killing Bob Yule. It is because of this feeling that the people and the children that he sees are just as much a part of his family as they are anyone else's family. Um, which is a huge thing, right? Because if we all buy into what the ladies believe that if you're not part of a family and you're not part of the specific family, you're uncivilized. And if you don't have separate family units, you're uncivilized, right? But if, if we subscribe to that idea, well then, Jem and Scout are killed by Bob Ewell. But if we believe in this idea that the circumstances that we raise children in and the people that are around us have as much to do with who our children end up being, everyone is a parent in some way, shape, or form, well then, you know, that's how we get Arthur Radley saving the Finch children. You know. Yeah. This book, I think this is the third time I've read it. I think I read this, I read this in ninth grade. I read it a couple years later. I was probably probably 11th grade because that was when I would argue the height of the my my area was very involved in speaking out against injustice so I think I read it again around that time and I've read it now um, and it still gets to me and in this moment, as can be told by the way that I'm speaking um, and the way that my, my voice has changed throughout this, um, you know, it's still a very, very impactful book. And I encourage everyone to read it. Like I get that most, most people have read this in high school and they're like, oh, I'm done with this. Strongly encourage you to go pick it back up as an adult at some point in your life. Me, listening to this in the future, go pick it up again as an adult. Because it's a fantastic, fantastic novel. Like I said, I would argue that this is one of the great American novels. Um, certainly, I don't think it, it doesn't grasp things in the way that, that Moby Dick does, or it doesn't, doesn't challenge things like the way that, you know, East of Eden or the Grapes of Wrath do, right? It doesn't have that kind of biblical sense to it. But in a way that can be understood without diving so far deep in, this is maybe one of the greatest novels that does that. Um, so yeah, that's that. This is the, the longest, and probably will stay the longest for a while, uh, video by me. And I think that's appropriate. Ranking wise, I'm gonna put this just below Moby Dick. You know, I, I do love Moby Dick a lot. In terms of, but just in terms of teaching and my, my wanting to, the lessons that can be that can be learned and shared i think this 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 is right up there so that's that